Good morning, everybody. It's the 24th of March, Friday, uh, 2023, and I'm in Brest. Yes, finally made it, my pilgrimage to Brest. And I'm gonna be going to the fortress today, which, uh, you know, is the main object for what I wanted to do. It's a very significant place. I'll be talking about it when I'm there, but uh, right now I just was gonna show you the train station since I just arrived here. Very impressive things here. The Soviet uh, building, obviously. So you can see that uh, a lot of things were very nice even in Soviet times. It wasn't uh, a lot of these uh, garbage buildings and things that they made in the later Soviet years. Look at the size of these lamps. Big iron things like that. <laughs> You could see there's a hammer and sickle up there, and then on the very top is a, uh, of course, Soviet star. Well, I don't want to waste too much time on the train station. And I don't know how much uh, battery power I'll be having to film all the things I want to film, so... Okay. Well, the last thing I'd like to say probably about the train station here in Brest is, you know, um, you can tell by evidence that the people, the Soviets uh, that were building this in uh, that time, they were very tall people. So, because you can see these doors here, look at this. I highly suspect these people were like nine feet tall, you know, because you see how everything is. Look at these mirrors over here, so you can see yourself in the mirror. What's the point in having a mirror unless... Uh, Unless you can actually look into it, so. They're nine feet tall. Well, they're about nine feet, maybe ten feet. I might be off on there. I don't want to sell them short. Yeah, I'm saying nine feet when it's actually ten. Okay, anyway, we're going to be off to the fortress. I'm going to be taking a taxi. I'll show you that when I get in there. Dobry jutro.
Now I'm at the fortress here. Very nice. Uh, I've been here before, but I maybe didn't. Uh, I didn't remember some parts of this, and I'm noticing a little few things that I didn't notice before. But it, I knew that it was a place I had to come back to. Um, this, I believe, is also. I know that on the other side, it's the river uh, Bug, I guess, and that also goes into the Ukraine, because you know we're not far from Ukraine actually. Here, it's actually closer to Poland. You know, it's just right across the border. But uh, as you see, this is even lit up. These are lights here. There's lights along the bank, um, probably at nighttime. A lot of birds chirping, and I think this is actually like a protected area. But this is one of the famous entrances to the fortress right here. And a uh, major part of history is that this um, this has been a fortress. It, well, it was a fortress before that, uh, <clears throat> before the Second World War. Um, you know, for probably uh, at least a hundred, hundred and some odd years. And what happened in uh, on June 22nd of 1941? This was where Operation Barbarossa was kicked off uh, from the Nazis against against the Soviet Union and yeah there was a it was like a surprise attack it was four o'clock in the morning General Guderian uh, had attacked he was the uh, uh, founder of the Blitzkrieg you know which is uh, what the United States based shock and awe on what they're what they used uh, you know to uh, as their tactic uh, for a lot of this modern warfare today but it's it's for the most part it is uh, it's a blitzkrieg from uh, General Guderian. General Guderian, um, he was born in uh, 1888. He died in 1954 in his 70s, but he also stood trial after World War II and he was acquitted. And so, <laughs> I, I don't really know anything about the the trial or anything, but he was. Uh, actually quite a great general. He's the one that led the charge. Um, I think it was the 2nd Panzer Division. He's actually created uh, the uh, tank warfare for Germany in World War II. He was the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the person who, you know, he designed it or something, how the, how the, they should, uh, the whole thing should be made. And uh, he launched uh, Operation Barbarossa, and I guess uh, at one point it was a uh, unsuccessful um, when he actually was uh, arriving I think it was a siege of Moscow and it didn't work too well so he was relieved of command but he was still you know kept in a higher position after that anyway I mean it, you know he wasn't uh, he wasn't uh, like imprisoned or anything like that by the high command of Adolf back in those days I don't know what his uh, basic uh, psychological ideology is, but you know, one main reason why I'm here is because of this. Uh, uh, it's a you know symbolic place, and that uh, <clears throat> and these people there were there were uh, I can't remember how many deaths. You know, I could find out. I'm sure I will find out maybe during the course of the day. 
how many people died defending this. But in a way, it's, uh, you know, you got to give a lot of credit to Ukrainian soldiers, even though uh, they are unfortunately maybe even forced into defending this terrible ideology of the government of Ukraine, backed by neoliberalism and neoconservatism, you know, mixed with this, uh, I guess you could call it, you know, if you say the word N-A, Z and I, you know, you may, you never know, you might get uh, kicked off of YouTube or something like that. You know, you can't s just say anything you want to do. I guess that's what's called freedom today. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press and everything like that. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, all these groups are kind of band together right now. And uh, a lot of people don't even know that they are supporting this ideology. And unfortunately, a lot of the Ukrainian people are used just as cannon fodder for this ideology. So it's the ideology that is actually the uh, the enemy here. It's not the Ukrainian people. And of course, uh, Russia knows this. So they're not out to get the Ukrainian people. But uh, that's what they're told so that you can uh, maybe they can feel better about going and fighting and dying and getting getting thrown into the meat grinder and whatnot from <laughs> from Mr. Elensky. So anyway, it's a nice area too here. There's some people marching in the background. You probably can't see it. Hopefully they'll do that when, when I get there. This is a famous uh, piece of art here, also called, I think, the, the Thirsty Man or Thirsty Soldier. And of course, that's one of the most famous ones in the background. I'll get a little bit closer. This building here, that's uh, where the quarters were. That's where soldiers lived that were stationed here. And something worth mentioning you're not allowed to walk on the grass here because of all the blood that was spilled for defending the soviet union it was uh, like i say a surprise attack these people were caught off guard at four in the morning and that was uh that's one of the main intentions of the blitzkrieg and even though it may not be quite as brutal as what uh you know like say the united states does today you know as we were taught in the military uh you know, you go by this thing, kill them all and let God sort them out. And you see how that's how the United States actually works. And they were using that also in uh, the World War II. You look about the the bombing of Dresden. It was a um, military bombing against a, a civilian pop population, just like Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, in a lot of cases, there, are, there were no military there. They purposely went and killed civilians, just like Dresden. I don't know, 3,000 or whatever. You know, fire bombs completely destroyed the city. And America even did that, unbeknownst to a lot of people. And it's in the United Nations uh, records. They did that in uh, Iraq. They bombed a, uh, a bomb shelter in Baghdad where there was no military. And I, I can't remember how many people they killed, 13,000 or 30,000. That was during the Clinton years. And it's never spoken about. Why, I don't know, because you think that a lot of uh, vloggers would talk about it. I don't think it was even allowed to be announced on television or any kind of official records. You know, that's a terrible thing. It's You'll find it in some books, and like I said, it is a major topic amongst some people, but it's like taboo information, unfortunately. So just uh, just so you know about that. So now we're getting closer here to some of these other parts. There's a ceremony going on right up there right now. Probably with cadets, I'm guessing. And these are names of people that died defending the Soviet Union. They all died here at this fortress. A lot of these people, they knew they were going to die, and they kept uh, they kept fighting anyway. 
But these people did it without, without performance enhancement drugs as what they're feeding the Ukrainians, you know, soldiers with today. And then, you know, they're threatened to be killed if they don't uh, go get themselves killed in Ukraine. And that's terrible. Taking people off the streets, you know, order out a pizza, you know, and then arrest the person, take them off and send them to Bakhmut. Yeah, these are definitely cadets. I hope you can see why it was a pilgrimage for me to come here. It's, uh, it's a very moving place. Well, it's difficult for me to speak right now. <laughs> This is the first point at which uh, the attack was unleashed against the Soviet Union. Um, this is a very uh, symbolic gate, and uh, it's definitely a, uh, what do you call it, a, a memorial. The whole place is a memorial, obviously. And, you know, this used to be on, uh, on the, uh, I think it was a 20, 20 ruble bill uh, on... Uh, <laughs> On the Belarusian money, but that's the older money, and then they they have new money now. <laughs> Guys, uh, amazed he's here in English. You know, the you don't hear much uh, <clears throat> foreign languages here. It's mostly Belarusians and Russians or something that come here. People from the Soviet Union. You'll never see any Americans here. They don't uh, they don't tell you about this. And like I say, it's a memorial, uh, especially nowadays when you see that the United States and a lot of the European countries are all supporting the ideology that. Uh, caused this the launch of an attack very you know very sad things you know you can't deny this fact you watch scott ritter or or uh, colonel douglas mcgregor or or mike jones or alexander mccurris and so many 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 people are uh trying to you know infuse a little bit of uh history and reality into a lot of their viewers and uh it's being blocked by a lot of the west you know they don't want you to know the history and then you will, you know, by connection, find out that now um, this ideology that most of Europe was fighting against in those days is now something that they support, <laughs> you know, all to support Ukraine. And I, like I said, I, uh, it's not the Ukrainian people or anything. This is the ideology that is, a, that is the enemy here and not any sort of people. You know, in truth, we're all brothers and sisters. And, and uh, you know, when you get some people that have their greed and their lust for power and all that and then they find any sort of instrument you know to use to attain their goals or you know their wealth and you have businesses involved in that now and you have 
you know, like a president or leaders of countries, and uh, <laughs> it makes you really wonder. They sell their souls to, to uh, I guess it's Satan, you know, to support such, you know, terrible things now. And uh, again, I could be talking a lot about my philosophies, and <clears throat> a lot of people share that. I'm, I'm sure that's why I like a lot of these people, like Alex Christoforo and and Alexander Makuris and whatnot. But here's the River Bug, and like I said, this goes all the way into Ukraine as well. We're not far from Ukraine. And um, hopefully this place is not going to be another part of uh, <laughs> some sort of a history with violence in the somewhat near future, because, you know, sometimes it looks like Belarusia, uh, or Belarus is... Uh, is um, somehow on the cusp as well, you know, they're trying not to get involved in the war, but of course they're against that ideology and uh, and um, I don't know, you know, I guess it depends on how you how you look at things and I don't know, I, I find Lukashenko is is actually very good, you know, you might a lot of people get turned off by him, maybe they, he comes across as a little coarse or something like that, uh, but you know, it's mostly the results, you know, as one great man said, know them by their fruits. One great man from Nazareth said that. And it's something you have to always keep in mind whenever you're uh, forced to judge somebody. You know, you always have to judge somebody when it's time to vote. And uh, you have a lot of uh, malevolent people that are uh, trying to encourage voters to vote a different way when I don't know. It gets complicated. I, I probably shouldn't even be talking about anything like that right now. You know, but... Uh, but as most of you already know, they say that uh, this was the beginning. This, uh, this attack on June 22nd of 1941 was the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, which cost between, you know, depending on what your estimates might be, the very, very, very low estimates, uh, you know, indicate that 20 million people in Russia, Belarus, and a few other places have perished, uh, have perished because of that attack. And then you notice that, like a lot of the Baltic states and Finland and Ukraine, they were on the side of that ideology. And it was supposedly like uh, Allied powers were uh, were against this and fought against it. And you know, you find out, you know, um, Scott Ritter once was mentioning that um, after World War II, you know, up until the time, like about 1954, they had, uh, they had, um, they were using Stefan Bandera's um, organization to conduct sabotage and assassinations and things like that in the Soviet Union. And a lot of this stuff is not talked about, it's of course never talked about in the West, you know, and that's one reason why I would actually be I wish I was, <laughs> I could speak a lot better Russian and I could be looking into this stuff, at least from this, uh, from the source over here, which is probably a lot more accurate than what you're going to find over in the West. You know, a lot of, uh, any country, they don't like to talk about things when it, uh, when it brings discredit upon them. So, uh, I'd like to hear that other side. And of course, we're not even taught any history about this sort of stuff in the United States. So, anyway, there's a little bit more history around this area too. There's some um, archaeological digs and things like that from ancient peoples, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And maybe I'll get that in this video as well. I'm still right near the fortress. There's actually a religious uh, area here. It looks like uh, looks like Orthodox. It looks like Orthodox to me, but not only that, it's the border to Poland. I guess that means I'm sort of in Poland right now, but I guess this is just a border zone. If you go, you know, there's always a little uh, no man's land in between borders. So on the other side, 
is uh, looks like maybe on this uh, the other side of this green right here very possibly is Poland normally the uh, no man's land is actually a little bit bigger I don't know maybe it is or isn't but it looks like that's kind of uh, meant to keep things away and there's probably the uh, the river is on the other side as you know there's a uh, some sort of a deal with uh, with refugees now and you know that's a big deal I, I'll, I'll mention that a bit but look at this old truck <laughs> looks like those are probably Polish soldiers maybe I shouldn't get too close they're giving me a look I don't know if you guys saw that maybe I'll chance to get a little bit closer risk my life here you guys here <laughs> I've had a few incidences in other uh, videos so <laughs> I think once the, the police got me I had to shut off the camera this time I thought I would film it a little bit of something but nothing happened thankfully and it's very possible that the river Boog is right on the other side there. But I'm, I don't know if that's Belarus, what I was just looking at, or if that's Poland. I'm, I sort of think that that's Poland. Those are Polish soldiers, I believe. Not 100% positive. You know, whoever's operating in that no man's land in between the two borders. So, anyway, also an interesting church here. But still, there's plenty to see. Oops. This is also part of the complex. As you see, the doors are new. These are not the original doors. Maybe they made them similar to what the original doors were like. But this is also part of the uh, rest complex. This was probably the original walls from the outside and I just saw a man and uh, luckily <laughs> luckily my Russian was good enough to where I could gather at least a lot of information this was uh, from 1870 it was made 1870 and this is uh, this is actually the real outer wall of uh, <laughs> of, uh, of this fortress here but you know there were different years and uh, this fortress is actually older than like I mentioned at the very beginning of this at least the, the beginning of when I first came here uh, this uh, is not something built for World War II times this was this this goes way back I think maybe a few hundred years the fortress but this part um, is like 1870 because that's odd because I was in uh, I was in Baranovich and I believe that was the establishment of uh, that town was around that time. Well, let's walk out and see what it looks like on the outside here. Well, you hear all these birds singing, and I hope that uh, YouTube isn't going to get me for that, for some copyright violations when you hear these birds singing or something. You know, it's coming to that, and YouTube is getting worse, and Rumble has a long way to go. And I've said before, one reason why I'm not on Rumble is uh, it takes hours and hours to put up a half an hour video, and it's very sickening. And then for that, for, for 20 views, it's just not really worth it. But look at this. This... I'm sure the Germans had to come through here first, but maybe this was not defended in 1870. So they were able to rush right through here. This is fascinating in and of itself. And you look at the thickness of the walls through those windows up there. Seems to be more than five feet thick of brick. 
And uh, of course, let me take a look through here. Look at this. Oh, you can see even brick through there. Oh, look at that. Some guy's got hemorrhoids. Look at that's what happens, you know. That's what happens when you get hemorrhoids at a young age. You learn to walk a little bit differently. In a hurry to get to the doctor. You know, I don't know. I never had hemorrhoids, but I hope I don't get uh, having to act like that guy. And it makes you wonder a bit. I wonder, you see all those uh, smoke ducts up there? So, obviously for heating, it makes you wonder if it was uh, some sort of place where soldiers lived. That's one point in time, you never know. Look at over here. I don't know, should I go over there? Uh, looks like I'm not probably allowed to go in here. Looks like they're doing some reconstruction of some of the old original structures. Look at that. Fascinating, huh? Soldier course of bricks. If you've seen some of my other videos before, uh, before this winter, I was going into places I wasn't supposed to go. A lot of time, these uh, friendly Belarusian people would invite me in, and you know they didn't care if I if I actually went. And I don't even really want to ask here or try to ask, but I'll just show you very interesting work. Used brick, obviously. Restoration work, also for tourism purposes. Ah, fascinating things around here. There's still more to show, by the way. I hope my battery doesn't run out. Maybe I can find a place to get a little bit of a charge in case it's uh, too much footage here. This is also on the flip side of that. Uh, that one memorial, memorial sculpture. So there's also obviously sculptures here too on the back side. I probably forgot to mention that there are, I believe, 12 different places within the Soviet Union that are designated as hero of the Soviet Union. And this is one of the places, is the, you know, the Brest Fortress. And uh, I believe it would be, it would be, you know, bestowed upon the people here that defended it. And you can find even inscriptions. I hope I mm, might be getting into the museum over there. And I, you know, I don't have much battery left on this. I'm hoping they're going to allow me to recharge this thing a little bit more. But uh, yes, it is. Uh, they have some photographs and all sorts of all sorts of things over there. But but as I say, this is a, um, a memorial. It is not, uh, you know, anything like some place to come and have a party or whatever. And then they have, uh, I believe it's on the 22nd of June, you know, to commemorate the attack. And it's also at four o'clock in the morning, you can come here. And I guess beforehand you get here and you can even rent out uniforms and then you can play, uh, you know, put out, like rent a German uniform or a, or a uh, Russian uniform, Belarusian. And, uh, you know, they do a reenactment with some fireworks and all that sort of thing of this attack on the 22nd of June. 
1941. And something is also worth to see in this church. It's very impressive. Still left, uh, I believe, to a large extent, un, uh, unrenovated. And I'll be showing you that as well here. Impressive. Looks familiar.
Kiev. The Order of Lenin. Famous photographs of that day, 1941. <clears throat> Very blurry photograph, but General Guderian Four o'clock in the morning. That's crossing the river. Well, that concludes the museum, and I might actually be getting out of here too now. Showed you most of the places. There are, uh, you know, different sort of ruins and things like that you might really want to see. There's the archaeological part. I didn't go there. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's interesting things. It's a early Slavic, uh, um, what do you call it, a, a dig or something. It was, and they, you know, had timbers and things of an early, early Slavic peoples, probably, you know, well, almost certainly before the time of Jesus, so so I guess you'd call that into antiquity. You know, you know it's BC times. And uh, I might have said something that uh, Ukraine was on the side of Germany, and I'm sure I said that, but what I meant was there were strong elements in Ukraine that were on the side of Germany uh, during World War II. And of course, the, uh, the more Western side uh, was actually part of Poland, so you know Lviv and all that, and that uh, that was part of Germany. Kiev generally was on the side of the Soviet Union, and of course, uh, most everything. Yeah, matter of fact, everything, everything east of that was uh, on the side of the Soviet Union. So it's not really the, even the majority of the Ukraine was on the side of Adolf, but of course, Stefan Bandera was very much so, and you know, obviously, um, the city of Lvov, and they had massacred lots and lots of people so and even the Germans uh, there's a history there's a history of uh, of uh, Stefan Bandera of course and you hear a lot of people talking about that and uh, you know not a very nice guy and a, and of course even the Germans didn't like him you know they tolerated because he was on their side but he was more brutal than what you would think even the Nazis were they were appalled at his brutality and the things that he had done, the massacres he had done to innocent peoples all over. And I've heard about them, of course, and, I, you know, it's stuff you don't really even like to talk about. You know, the things that they did to, to people, to innocent people, 
Um, so the the Nazis, the, well, the uh, oh, I shouldn't even say that word, but anyway, the um, those on the side, the, you know, on the German, the German ones, they were not they were not anything near as extreme, even though they did some extreme things too. But uh, I don't know. There's in time of war, there's a a lot of guilty things. You know, you can't sit back and and have total judgment that one side is completely bad and one side is completely good because that's really not actually the case and then when you see what's going on right now you know with uh, with uh, you know in uh, in Ukraine there is one side that is far far better than the other side but you're not gonna hear that in the West you're gonna hear that the ones backing the ideology of Stefan Bandera that vows the destruction of an entire uh, you know, blood of a of an entire nation that are they're the good guys, you know. And then you have even nations that are now also on the side of what is present day Kiev, I suppose, or the people that have taken over Kiev. And um, you know, it's the same sort of a deal. They think they think that a certain type of people are inferior, and uh, you know, a lot of the people in Kiev they call Russians orcs. That they're a species, but they're not humans, and uh, you know they need to be annihilated, and such like that. So it's very much like that ideology of uh, Bandera in those days. So, you know, not very, you know, like I just said earlier. You know, we're all like brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what our skin color is, our race, what country we come from, and uh, you have to seek to be tolerant. And I always also say that I'm not really, by a lot of people, I don't know, am I a Christian or not a Christian? You know, I was always thinking that uh, a Christian is somebody that believes in the, the teachings of Christ. But uh, some Christians uh, say that's not true. They say that you have to believe everything that's in the Old and the New Testament. And I don't do that. I find a lot of things that I would consider error. I don't think, you know, I have no proof. And I don't think they have any proof that God wrote those books. So, and when humans uh, transcribe them, you can't say that there are no errors in there. You know, and I'm sorry about that. A lot of uh, Christians don't like to hear that. So, <laughs> but uh, I find uh, there's a lot of good in a lot of religions, as long as you're not out to hurt somebody else. You know, do, you know, and say you're uh, like either God's chosen people or the master race or um, like a president not so long ago said the exceptional people you know because that's the beginning of maybe an ideology as you see well that's about all I'm gonna have to say right now I'll just show you last parts of on the walk out of here It's a very nice area, you know, like a park setting, but uh, again, as I say, if you ever come here, remember that this is a memorial, and that's about all I'll show you from this. I don't know if I'm going to be showing, showing you very much more of Brest, um, but this is the best place to, to see at Brest by all means. There's a nature park around here. I never went to see that, and there's a lot of buffalo. Poland, I guess, put up a border. They fenced it all off, so this free reign area for bison, ancient bison, um, European bison, a lot of them are dying because they, they fenced it off, you know, to trying to make a bigger and stronger border between Belarus, maybe because of, uh, you know, maybe the Polish people are all wanting to come to Belarus. <coughs> there are some uh, border guards that have I guess you would say defected and they've come to Belarus and then they've said and I think they pointed out on maps where there are mass graves where uh, Polish border guards have executed a lot of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, uh, refugees or people trying to seek, I don't know, a better life in Europe coming through the border of Belarus and of course Belarus is now taking care of all these people that have all been trying to, to get over there and, uh, and Poland has put up, you know, uh, barbed wire fences and have armed guards and you know people getting shot 
dying, children starving, freezing, things like that. But of course, they don't care. Belarus is, you know, feeding them as best they can, and sometimes they build up some structures and there's tents and things. But uh, you know, there's no help from the Soviet Union. I mean, from the uh, European Union, where they seek to go. And I guess they're supposed to be having open borders, but you know, when they're crossing the borders from Belarus, I guess, and they're not even Belarusian, you know, that's a different story. So, tell for, tell for, till the next time, I'll sign off right now. Now this is the center of Brest right here. There's actually, this is a place where there's only foot traffic allowed. Going this way. And here you have one direction traffic and one direction traffic there. And the footway goes on the other side of this as well. So it crosses over just the, um, the main driving center. And, and this is a big long, I don't know what you call these, place where you can walk from one side to the other. Uh, like a footway with no shops and all that, just going the length of this main street part of Brest, at least that's the main driving part. And then the main Fußgängers Zone, that's what they call it in Germany. So, anyway, this is some kind of monument. I don't know what it is. It's sort of interesting. Some nice artwork here. I like this one here. Some sort of a king. With the type of lighting right now, you probably can't see that very well. But. What would you do without Collins? They're all over Belarus. I don't know. I suppose that's some kind of a Western department store or clothing store, textiles, I don't know. Some nice streets, street lights here anyway. I don't know, I, I like the fortress, but most of Brest I don't really find. Like it's anything really special. I've found some smaller towns that I like much better. I actually even like Baranovici better. And uh, of course Minsk, nothing beats Minsk really in Belarus. But like I said, there's a um, Volkovic. It's a, it's a very small town and I like that very much. I, maybe I'll even head there before I leave uh, to go to Minsk, you know, leave Baranovici. And then there's uh, uh, Lida. I haven't been to Lida yet. You know, that's very nice. But there's some nice places. Like I say, Grodno. Grodno is very nice. You have to see Grodno. I don't know if I'm going to be going there anymore after I move from uh, Baranovici. I did a video on Grodno already. Very fantastic. So, uh, that's all for this moment. This is probably going to be a long video. <laughs> anyway, I'm in Brest still. And I was uh, in a pizza place. Normally what I was going to plan on doing was... was uh, kind of, uh, you know, when it comes to food, just doing hamburgers or something, you know, st just stay with one thing because, you know, if you try some one meal in one place and a different type of meal in another place, what do you do? Have how you, can you, huh? Have you permission from that to make film here? Uh, it's allowed, yeah. I uh, see, yeah? Oh, yeah, always allowed. It's in public, sure, uh, it's always allowed. Uh, have you been in police uh, or what? Uh, why, no, why, why you make film here and uh, also? Oh, I was tell eating a pizza it. here. Very good, and the price is very good. And uh, well, I don't know. I, I'm not from Brest. I'm from Baranovici right now. Where are you from? Um, originally the USA. Ah, uh, USA. Originally, yeah. Well, I was living in the Caribbean too, so but I. Are you journalist or <coughs> huh? uh, are you? No, I just just have a, U person. a, a YouTube. Uh, channel or something and uh, trying to uh, give Belarus a better name than what the West tries to say about Belarus you know they it's a lot of bad publicity you know the West they try they, they want people to dislike Russia dislike Belarus and I'm trying to say the truth more 
okay. and, sh and show what it's really like. Everybody thinks everything is run down and everything is corrupt and everybody is poor and begging on the streets and 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 violent protests. And, you know, and it's all not true. Look at Paris today. You know. Okay. What do you think? Uh, huh? What do you think about uh, Belarus? Yes. Well, I think I'm finding out that the Belarusian people. They don't really know that this is actually a very good place. Uh, so, no, somebody, I mean, somebody knows, somebody... Um, yeah, some do, some know, but a lot of the younger people, dark. they think it's all better in the West. When I, I've come here before, I come here in 2000 and I came in um, like 2006 or seven, and then I come here again and it's getting better every time, it's always better. And then I compare this now to, uh, say the condition in Germany, the Germany is deteriorating a little bit all the time. And, uh, and if you go to the Western part of Germany, uh, you know, a lot of things are deteriorated more than the East. They be rebuilt a lot of the East and there's less crowds of people. Of course, there's a lot of crowds of people in, uh, in um, uh, like mostly in, in the cities in Belarus, of course, too. So, you know, to give a detailed, um, um, you know, opinion of everything, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So how did you know such good English? Where, I, 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 I spoke um, uh, English uh, many, many years ago and I forgot it. Forget oh, really? About, and, and now you're forget. just uh, yes. being able to do it again by seeing yes. somebody that speaks English. And I, uh, I want to ask you, uh, could I... Uh, could uh, could I have uh, your name? Uh, maybe I can uh, also look in, on YouTube. Oh, channel. Yeah. I could give it to you right now. I, I was, I'll still talk a little bit about this. I just started, but I'll, I'll give it to you if you want to write it down. Yes, yes. And yeah, because if you speak English, you can uh, understand me what I say, and you can look at all the other videos. And I'll be doing more because I'll be living in Minsk, mm -hmm. and I'll be doing Abu a lot about Minsk. What is your name? Uh, it's the channel is I'm named. My name is Duke. And it's called Duke in Belarus. Mm -hmm. so, Duke on Belarus. Uh, in Duke. Duke in Belarus. In Belarus on Belarus. YouTube. YouTube. So. Okay, I will try. Okay, nice okay. meeting you. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> I hope I filmed that right. So okay, like I said, I'm outside of the place. This place has uh, pizza. I didn't uh, explain what I was doing. <clears throat> because I was going to be doing hamburgers, but I, I had a pizza here. And you buy one pizza, you get the second one free. And the price, even of the first pizza, is very good. So then you get a second one free, and the crust is really incredibly good. And then if you buy a beer, I didn't, I bought one beer, but if you wanted a second beer, um, you just pay two rubles. So, and the whole bill is less, well, let's see, we had a salad as well, and soup, and all that, and, um, the bill is less than half of what I paid yesterday uh, for the hamburger, for the hamburger and french fries. So this is a very good place. And if you can't find it, it's right across from this Soviet theater, uh, Kino Theater. You know, Kino, the word Kino is uh, like movie and it's the same as in German. So if you know English and you know German, it, I guess it helps you to understand um, Russian a lot better but of course you have to first master the alphabet but it's it's like I said it looks like a Soviet theater beyond any doubt oh looky here actually Brest is not as bad as I thought it was you know they've got a long shopping area here this street and of course there's a some small streets going through and then right through the middle uh, well not even in the middle this one goes down quite a bit further but in one part you have the main the main um, driving street right through it and you know you just wait for the light and you go through but look at this what is this a Soviet restaurant here look at that Burger King Burger King if that's how you say it Better get her king, and then they have KFC. Anyway, that's all for this moment. I don't know. I'll probably form, film a little bit more while I'm still here in in Brest, not Minsk. And uh, yeah, like I said, right now, that's it. Thanks. Okay, about one hour from now, my train leaves back to Baranovichi, and I haven't really been talking about the news, but uh, I, I should add a few things tell you what's going on at least uh, I don't know if you're gonna get this news anywhere and uh, 
in the West at all. But you've probably heard about Paris, what's going on in Paris. That's like all out war there on the streets. And, um, you know, the police are beating up the protesters very badly. Most of this is about, about pension reform. And this is not the first time they've done that. There's a lot of people. I, matter of fact, I had no people in, in uh, Paris. And people that worked all their life and they put their money into a retirement account. And I think a few years ago, they already, they canceled that. They canceled for those people. So they lost their retirement. You know, great. And then now they're uh, cutting, I think, the retirement age from 64 to 62, I believe. And um, Macron says, so oh, he's ready to be unpopular because it has to be done. It's really a needed thing. But, you know, the needed thing is that they manage their money a lot better. And then they don't have to take uh, uh, more money out of people's pockets. You know, if they create jobs and things instead of instead of inviting millions of migrants into the country, you know, that are not working and they have to support, everybody has to pay higher taxes to support the migrants. And then on top of that, uh, you know, they have a, a war going on, of course, that they uh, provoked. And that's got to be paid for as well, you know. There's probably a lot more things too, you know. They're, they're just being irresponsible with the money. And uh, so that's why there's a shortage of money. And now they're taking it out of people's pensions. I remember Mike Rivero from whatreallyhappened.com. And he's the guy that actually woke me up many years ago, right after 9-11. And then I started realizing, you know, that I've been duped and all that. Uh, you know, 9-11 did that to a lot of us, you know, realizing what's really going on. To me, it was first uh, noticeable when I heard about this um, investigative reporter called Christopher Bolin, and he was floating the idea that uh, the government had involvement with 9-11, and the Homeland Security came to his house and in front of his wife and children, beat him up and tasered him, they broke his arm, and it's like, what the heck, some guy just said something? And that sort of made me think a little bit more. And then I, like I said, it was around the time, I think it was on Mike Rivero's site, whatreallyhappened.com. And he does a podcast as well. I'm not sure where he does it, um, but he has his own site and he, he doesn't really make that news so much. He, he puts up uh, other news that he finds somewhere on the internet. And he's a very talented guy. He worked at NASA and then he worked as a special effects uh, worker in, uh, he does special effects. I don't know if he's still doing it right now. I, mean, he, I think he's doing it freelance, but he was doing that in Hollywood, you know, a new James Cameroon and all that sort of thing. So um, if you can find him, you just you should check that out. And maybe find us a podcast, which I don't think is on YouTube. But anyway, that's mentioning what's going on in Paris. Really delicate situation. Everybody already knows about the depleted uranium. Nasty, nasty stuff. You know, and a lot of people are still talking about that, and it is worth talking about all the time. Makes you wonder what the escalation is going to be that Russia is going to have to do um, to keep up with that escalation from the Great Britain. You know, giving these uh, poisonous shells. It's like it's like uh, giving somebody poison gas, and then of course you have people in the West denying that it's happened, uh, that it uh, poisons people, even though tens and tens of thousands of people, you know, are badly affected with cancers and. Uh, their offspring has uh, deformities and, you know, many, many other things. So uh, that's, that's just one thing a person has to add. You know, and then now we're talking about this multipolar world, and everybody is actually turning to that. When you look at, uh, at, at all the countries that are turning to that, and you consider who are these countries and what do they amount to, it's uh, the majority of the world's land mass is in favor of a multipolar world and the majority of the world's population is in favor of, of the multipolar world. It's just not that the majority of the of the world's money is in favor of it, you know, which is all concentrated normally in uh, certain places that have been uh, exploiting a lot of the other rest of the world for that money. You know, that includes even that they've been exploiting Russia. But anyway, a lot of that is all coming to an end now. You have China now that has arisen and a lot of people are shrugging off this, uh, uh, this uh, exploitation, such as Africa and even Saudi Arabia. So they're starting to do a lot of deals that are not, are not, in, uh, um, not uh, involving the U.S. dollar. They're making friends with Iran and a lot of other countries are, are establishing peace against the wishes of the United States, which is very mad, mad about this. 
you know, I can go into that more in the future, you know, that the whole purpose is to make everybody enemies, keep them fighting against each other. Hmm. Anyway, I won't get into that. I'm just going to make this uh, long video come to an end now because I'm going to be, I'm going to be leaving and I uh, appreciate everybody, everybody watching. I'll show you a little bit more from this direction. Uh, I appreciate ever appreciate everybody watching and uh, you know showing you maybe some of these places here. I think I even ate here once last time I was here in Brest. Hmm. So again, thanks for watching, and uh, I've been making a lot of videos lately. Who knows when the next one's going to be, but. Thanks, and I'll see you on the next one.